And we are live. Welcome everyone to the Connected Learning TV and final webinar in a month-long series titled Minecraft in Education, Leveraging a Game-Based Learning Environment for Connected Learning. I'm Rick Moffitt. Uh, I'm an educational technology expert and senior technical consultant at Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I'll be the host for today. Throughout November, we've been exploring the appeal and educational potential of Minecraft. Today we're going to hear about some outside-of-the-box ways educators are making use of Minecraft. Uh, before we dive into our chat, though, let's go over a few quick details. To those participating uh, on the live stream right now, we encourage you to use the chat to introduce yourselves, uh, connect with each other, and ask questions that we can address here in the Google Plus Hangout. And speaking of Google, we're chatting uh, throughout the month in a couple different places, the Minecraft Teachers Google Group and the Minecraft in Education Google, Google Plus community. Uh, the links for those uh, should be in the live stream chat. The link for our public group notes Google Doc for today should also be in the live stream chat. And we'd really appreci appreciate your energy in capturing the highlights and sharing resources related to today's conversation. That Google Doc will uh, remain open to the public so we can continue adding to it uh, even after today. Um, we're joined by some great folks here in the Hangout, and I want to give everyone a chance to introduce um, themselves briefly. Um, and uh, Stephen Elford, do you want to start us off? Sure thing. Um, my name's Stephen Elford. I'm a secondary school teacher from Australia. Um, I prim primarily teach maths and science to uh, 12 to 18-year-olds in my school. I've been using Minecraft for about two years now and, and using that as a way to sort of spice up my lessons and get the kids thinking in different ways and engage them in their learning. I think Thanks, that's you, Stephen. Shane. Yep. Yeah, you don't have to wait for me. You can just move on to the next. Shane, you want to go next and we'll go right to left? Sure. Um, <clears throat> my name is Shane Asselstein. I'm a curriculum and technology coordinator uh, in Honolulu, Hawaii. I teach uh, math and technology to grades 3 to 6. John Miller, you want to say hello? Okay, and uh, I'm John Miller, and I'm a seventh grade history teacher in uh, Central Coast of California, but I've taught uh, six, seven, and eight all subject areas, and I've been using Minecraft for uh, the last year and a half or so. All right, Joel. Uh, my name is Joel Levin. Um, uh, for 10 years, I was a New York City uh, private school teacher. Uh, for the last three of those years, I was teaching with Minecraft in a whole bunch of settings uh, at an elementary school level. I was running high school clubs. I've done various after schools uh, in, a, in a number of different settings, so I have quite a lot of uh, Minecraft teaching experience under my belt. Uh, right, now, right at the moment, I'm the uh, chief education officer of uh, Teacher Gaming, the company that makes Minecraft EDU. And Jackson? Hi, I'm Jackson Williams. I'm a T4 coordinator out of the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, I use Minecraft to work with my teens, or they're part of my teen tech program. And I work with Joel and providing them the opportunity and learning more about Minecraft and the EDU format education. Great. Um, and you've all talked a little bit about what you do, but I think maybe it would be interesting to hear um, from each of you um, maybe a short description of a project that's worked well or a project that you're, you've been happy with. Um, I know after speaking with, with many of you and a lot of people in the Minecraft teachers group also, it takes a long time to put together a good lesson. It can take a long time to put together a good lesson. It's a lot of work. And if we could maybe give people an idea of what you've accomplished and what it takes to put that kind of... Um, curriculum together for, for a class session or for you know for a lesson plan over the course of a, a week or a month, um, the type of work that goes into it. Um, I kind of like to hear what um, what's worked for, for each of you and what you've been happy about. Um, Jackson, if we want to start with you this time and work our way back, uh, you want to tell us something about what you've been working on with Joel? Um, I had the opportunity for two years in a row to work with Joel and work with the Global Kids. Uh, one of the good things we learned about that is the fact that you always have to prepare ahead of time um, in reference to the restrictions that Brooklyn Public Library has with technology, but what worked really well was 
uh, last year we brought together a group of T4s with a partnership out of the Hive with the Global Kids. And uh, thanks to Joel having basically conducting the whole class, we also worked with the kids and the facilitators and getting my T4s to work um, with the Global Kids kids and the Minecraft EDU component of the game, where Joel took over and run the whole show, basically made and came the kids explore how to have a hunger craft based on the Hunger Games. And the kids, some of the kids lived in districts while some of the other Global Kids kids live in the city. And the whole fo focus of the uh, game was having this idea of a hunger craft and having different resources and how they have to work together as a group to be able to f help each other sustain life and stick together. And that worked out really great because at first my teens wanted to combat the other group of teens from the other organization, but and towards the end, they all realize they have to work together because no district can stay alive without the work without the capital, and the capital can stay alive without the districts. So thanks to Joel, it worked out really great, and they wanted more and more and more. <laughs> so that was, and I'm hoping to repeat it again this year. <laughs> Me too. I, I think it worked out great because of the kids. Actually, <laughs> they were all really into the into the subject matter, and they were really excited to sort of explore the world of the Hunger Games through the lens of Minecraft, so to speak. At my next, I forget the order. I don't think it's in the same... Uh, you could be next, yeah. I'd, I'd okay. say go for it, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've worked in quite a few different settings. Um, so, you know, I, I think what Jackson was saying about planning is is really key to, to a successful, successful experience. I mean... Even if the the lesson you're doing with Minecraft is not very scripted, even if you're not planning to um, sort of do a top-down heavy approach to you're going to learn this and you're going to learn this, you you want to have it well planned so that you know, you know, even just the basics. Well, the, the students are going to come into the room and they're going to sit on the rug and we're going to talk and we're going to watch something on the screen and then we're going to go onto the the computer. You, you want to, you know, and it's 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 like teaching any class. You want to know the flow of how the lesson is going to go, um, you know, and and for the facilitator to be really familiar with the tool in this case, the game called Minecraft is also really important. Um, you know, I I have been in rooms where where teachers are are saying, "Isn't this great? We're we're using Minecraft, and and aren't the kids excited?" And then the teacher will turn to me and say, I have no idea what the, what's going on and what the kids are doing now. And, you know, th that can be a positive experience. It sort of depends on the culture of the school and how kind of focused the kids are going to be on their own. Uh, but, you know, there's no substitute for experience with the game uh, itself. Does it add something to the experience that the, the if your students know that you understand the game, you play the game, you can talk about maybe not just the lesson but other things that happen in the game? Do you get some any credibility or any other... Better, different interaction when they realize you're interested in something they're also interested in? Uh, definitely. I mean, I, I've walked into rooms, uh, you know, full of kids I've never met before to, to do a Minecraft project, and, you know, they'll, you know, they'll just view me, oh, you're just another adult. You don't, you don't get what I'm into. Right. You know, isn't that cute? You're going to play, you, you're going to play Minecraft with us. You, you think you understand it. And then, you know, I'll, I'll make some reference to the game or use some game slang, and, it, you know, you can see them, you know, their ears right. pick up and they pay attention, and I mean maybe there it is uh, a credibility thing with them. You know, you're you're able to speak their language. Um, you know, so yes, I think that is that is important. Okay. Uh, John, you want to uh, talk about what you're doing in your classes? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I'm kind of right in the middle uh, or near the end here of a of a project, and uh, I have to preface it with my students are. <laughs> I don't think they're unique, but they're they're quite unique, perhaps, in the Minecraft community in that they've never really played Minecraft. I have maybe two or three students in each class that has actively played Minecraft, and the rest, this was the first experience for them, and so they didn't really know what to expect. And I, I teach history, and so my, my idea was uh, at the, the end of a unit on China, uh, uh, studying the Tong Dynasty, we would recreate the, the Tong Dynasty capital city. Uh, it's called Chong'ang. And there's great references online, including uh, maps of the city itself. And so I, I took the map and just made a simple flat world with uh, 
outlined the streets and put a wall around it and I used a, a couple of schematics and dropped them in so the kids could see some ideas. We did a little research uh, for some Chinese looking style buildings and then I asked the kids to identify themselves as either a beginner, an intermediate, or an advanced Minecraft player. Knowing all along that advanced didn't really mean advanced, more like uh, proficient. Uh, and then I assigned them to uh, a block and they were either peasant homes and farms or uh, middle class homes or markets and I was, I've been absolutely stunned at the quality of work that they've been able to put together uh, from uh, temples to uh, incredible pagodas uh, to these fabulous farms and now what they're what they're doing now is they're writing about it they're actually putting uh, people inside the homes uh, at least they're writing about it they're going to put info blocks out so they're going to tell us who lives in that home uh, what their family is the family name and their jobs and uh, duties uh, and that's the uh, that was originally was supposed to be the, the the plan and it still is but I can see their enthusiasm and what a great job they've done is uh, I'm now planning after China we go on to the Mongols and so we'll learn a little bit about the Mongols and they don't know this yet but we're gonna come back to their world and we're gonna all hop on horses and we're gonna sack their city and uh, I, I can't wait to see <laughs> their reaction uh, when they get a carry, you know, running through the city on these on horseback and tear it down. Uh, but it, it should be fun, and, uh, and I, I'm looking forward to it. Right on. When you, you said you uh, separated people by um, skill level, did you put um, newer students with students who had experience hoping to have mentorship within the groups, or did you put all the experienced kids in one area and newer kids working together? I, I kept them like that. I kept the new kids uh, in groups of uh, three or four, and the there were only a few, as I said, in each class that were really advanced players, and I assigned them the, the larger areas like the emperor's gardens and the the palace for the right. prince and the more technical buildings. How long did it take the kids to the kids who were new to it to become um, proficient? It took about one and a half periods before they and that was it right. before they were yeah. really good at that building and they they grasped right. the idea. I said work outside the walls first. Let's play around with right click and left click and get used to that and then. Right. Uh, we've had very little problems. I've been really proud of what, they, what they've done. What's your split on uh, boys and girls in the class? Uh, it's about 50-50, and I, I know okay. when I hold my Minecraft, the lunchtime, uh, at lunch I have kids come in, and uh, uh, my, my classroom has been packed with kids working overtime on this project, uh, right. and it's been boys and girls. The, the girls love it as, as well. All right, that's great. Shane, I uh, want to move over toward you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> my current project that I'm working on is... Um, sorry, clear my throat there. My current project that I'm working on is with grades 3 to 6. Um, I have created the... Well, the school students actually created the school as a foundational map, and we have a neighborhood where the kids will invest their time to create a house, become part of the neighborhood, you know, kind of um, connecting to what Maria is talking about in the live stream about how the, the social structure is so strong with the kids and the cliques, but we actually have sixth graders living right next to third graders and there's no problems. Um, nobody's griefing or anything like that. Anyway, so the classrooms themselves, I use Miscraft to teleport them to ages and each age is a different concept. Uh, coordinate grids, uh, today we did um, a factory, a cobblestone factory, and we talked about multiplication. Um, and the kids will earn coins through the those lessons, come back and use that to spend money, so working with an economy within the game to purchase materials to then buy their house. So they don't actually bring materials back from any of the lessons, they actually have to earn the coins to then come back and buy the materials to build their house. Stephen? All right. Um, I'm involved in so many projects. It's it's been a, a roller coaster ride for me doing um, all of this all of this stuff. So I've done virtual tours. I've uh, all of my lessons are focused on 
um, getting uh, it's like a virtual space that I can use to get to get students exploring things in a different way. So whether it's math concepts or whether it's uh, science concepts or or performing proper experiments and stuff like that. So my biggest project this year was definitely a, a sort of real life math skill world where students got paid for doing work worksheets in the real world or managing their budget or anything like that and then um, they then got to use that money and, and purchase lots of land or mining licenses and and things like that so that's sort of where I was for the last six months in that sort of project as my key key project I was trying to maintain that's great um, this question uh I'm oh, sorry, does somebody want to say something? No, I, just, I was just realizing I failed to actually give a real example, <laughs> which is what you asked me to do. Um, one, one of the things that I'm working on right now that I'm really excited about is I'm doing an after-school program at the Museum of Natural History here in New York City, um, which, is, which has been great. The folks at the museum are all about exploring new ways to teach science con uh, content to kids in ways that are relevant and engaging. And... Uh, you know, last last winter we did uh, a, an experimental one-day workshop uh, with a project we called Food Craft that, that tied into one of their exhibits there, uh, which was successful enough that they wanted to try it as an after-school. So it's uh, we're working with kids in 8th through 12th grade, and each week we're, we're sort of brainstorming a, a different uh, activity in Minecraft that's linking with either an exhibit at the museum or an expert that the museum has at their disposal. So sort of the the quintessential example was we we had the kids playing Minecraft using the fossils and archaeology mod and they were digging up dinosaur bones and uh, hatching, extracting the DNA and hatching baby dinosaurs in the game and then we paused the game and we left the room and we went over to you know, the famous dinosaur exhibits in the museums, and the kids were looking up their dinosaurs that they had hatched. Uh, and then they came back to the game armed with knowledge about that species of dinosaurs to build a habitat for that baby dinosaur. So um, that, that, that sort of science-based content and sort of iterating and experimenting with a group of kids that are really engaged, really, um, really, really smart, and really pros at, at Minecraft, uh, has been fun. Although they're not all pros, there were a few kids that were completely new to the game. But uh, as as uh, I think it was John who was saying, you know, it took them about a day and a half to <laughs> to uh, find their their legs. Um, this question, uh, Shana was talking about this. Um, we didn't get to talk about it last week, but I think hearing about what you've created in your classrooms, um, what are the components of an engaging Minecraft lesson? How what is it about the way you design the class that um, engages the kids, first of all, keeps them interested, um, but not just in playing a game, but in learning the content that you're trying to deliver and that you probably have to deliver um, based on what, what's expected in, in your classroom? Um, I'll jump in there, I suppose, since it was the question that I, I put up there. Um, one of the things I actually find very useful and actually it kind of relates to something going on in the live stream. They're actually asking how exactly do you go from um, a creative map, they say, or just a, uh, a map that's been produced to creating a lesson in it. Um, typically what I will do is I'll come up with a learning objective that I want to accomplish and because I've played <laughs> so much Minecraft in the last six, seven months, I blame Elfie for that. Um, I, I know a lot about the game mechanics, and I know a lot of how those game mechanics could be used to teach certain concepts. You know, for instance, creating today's, you know, cobblestone factories. Oh, there's my R2-D2 again. <laughs> creating those cobblestone factories. I knew they'd get you two laughing. Um, you have to know about how a cobblestone, um, cobblestone works, right, and how you can get that to work together. And then you just utilize that. And I think the, the key importance for my kids are they want that immersive experience. I don't They don't want to be told they're in Egypt. They want to see they're in Egypt. They want to feel that they're in Egypt. They want to experience a factory. They don't want to be say, oh, this is a factory, but it's just a square building, Mr. Asselstein. No, they want to be in a factory. So I actually had to make the factory look like a factory, you know. So these are kind of some of the components that I find really important. So the game mechanics and the immersiveness of the environment. 
Yeah, I'll, um, Go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to say, I'll, I'll add to that. I think, I think the, the, the parts of a Minecraft lesson that make it engaging, I mean, Minecraft itself is, is engaging full stop, but it's not, it's not heavily scripting it necessarily, or if it is heavily scripted, it's doing it in such a way that it still maintains that game, that game level for the students. I think it's, it's, it's a fine line to walk between letting the students play while learning and, and making the students do learning while playing. Does that make sense? I think I think there's a fine line to walk there, and I think that's certainly an important thing when you are designing lessons or, or thinking about incorporating Minecraft into your classes. That you need to make sure that the kids aren't sort of scripted out of the fun part. I think you need to maintain that 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 fun part while doing it. Uh, most of you, I, I think, have taught for a number of years before you started using Minecraft in the classroom. Is there anything about using Minecraft that's changed the way you've changed the way you teach or changed the way you thought about teaching? When you see students who have um, an expertise, perhaps, or at least the ability to learn really quickly and to participate in their own learning, um, does that change the way you look at? Uh, your job as a teacher, or maybe uh, change the way you look at other subjects and the way you teach them? I'm going to jump in that one. <clears throat> one of the great lessons I learned from Joel is the idea of introducing them to exploration on their own. Um, taking over as a coordinator, I worked with a lot of the young, I, when I was a young adult librarian working with teens in the branches, one of the things I learned is about, um, I used to have teen tech time where I let them play video games like um, Rock Band and just let them choose whatever game they want to play. But Having a facilitator like Joel come in and work with them and tell them, hey, you have exploration. You can die right now. Explore the Minecraft, Hungercraft world. Go crazy. Do whatever you want to do. You also learn about what tactics they start coming up with, ideas about playing the game based as a group. One of the things I learned about that is that they come together and they assign different roles to each other automatically. Like, you will be this person. You'll be that person. There's always different personalities that just come up with leadership roles, who's going to be the person to collect the wood, who's going to collect fire. Just You let them run with the imagination and they just flip your whole world upside down. And that's what I learned from Joel and that's something I get to do to do any course or any lesson plans I ever do with any teens or any levels of coordinator. I run with that idea of letting them explore before I come up with the actual lesson plan. It, it turns out better that way let them add their own flavor to it. One of the other themes that we've been talking about um, over the months is, and Stephen touched on it, is the balance between um, using Minecraft to teach specific objectives um, versus free play. Um, and because I think one of the things that's exciting about video games, and you can go back to Henry Jenkins and participatory learning, and um, ideas like that, and uh, Mimi Ito talks about it with her uh, in her mobile research, um, how the participation and the connected uh, element is, um, there's learning going on all the time. It's not just in a classroom anymore. So I think there's a, there's a theory that if you just let kids play, that they're going to be learning something of value, whether it's about technology or collaboration or uh, social interaction, um, that we should just let people play, um, but then there's also um, a, a group that says we want very much to accomplish a specific set of learning goals. So, how do you, um, where do you fall on those two continuums? Is there value in just free play? Is there value in uh, scripted lessons? And um, how do you balance those? Well, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, I wrote about this a while ago on, on my blog. Um, I, you know, my own opinion has kind of evolved on this over the years. Um, when I first started teaching with Minecraft, maybe it was just you know sort of lack of confidence in my own teaching ability or in in Minecraft as a teaching tool. But you know I ran a very tight ship. I sort of said you know I would tell the kids here is the series of actions that we are going to do together today. And you know I I, I think it was still fun and I think it was still worthwhile. Um, but you know I didn't allow as much freedom. As, as I do these days, you know, sort of what Jackson's talking about, like trusting the kids to lead the experience themselves. So now when I design maps, I try to keep them very open-ended. I try to make it so there's never only one thing to be doing at any given time. 
uh, so that the kids can sort of, you know, organize and 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 divide up tasks in a way that that feels organic to the exercise. Um, but you know, now as that I re reflect on on these two different approaches. I actually don't feel that one is more or less effective than than the other. I you know I, I I've talked recently to one of those kids who was a second grader when I started them, and I guess and now he's a, a fifth grader. Um, you know I said what you know what did you think about those those early lessons? And he said oh those those were so much fun. It's you know, and it's different than when I play Minecraft now at home, but but it was great. And so you know it. I, I think it comes down to what your teaching style is as a teacher. Some teachers run a very tight ship. Um, some teachers uh, encourage exploration, and and you know most teachers are kind of somewhere in between. Uh, I think it also depends on the culture of the school. If uh, if you're at a school where everybody's buttoned down and wearing the uniform and uh, you know says yes sir yes ma'am, then probably having a very structured Minecraft experience. Um, is going to feel more natural, and 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 you'll reap the benefits for. It. So, uh, you know, I, in general, I I trust the instructor. This is not just Minecraft. This is across the board. I trust the instructor in the room who has a personal relationship with those, you know, 20, 25 kids, um, to know what the the best approach is, and to and to trust their instincts. And you know what? If it's wrong, that's the best thing about teaching is you get to come back the next day and try it differently. It's the best thing about video games too. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here, too. I, I want sure. desperately to uh, avoid the it's all about me trap uh, because Minecraft's so fun, and I think as we all get in there, it's like, it's like oh, I, can, I can't wait to, to tackle a great uh, concept and throw it out there in Minecraft, and these kids are going to love it. But at the same time, uh, I think we all have to be careful that we, we hand it to the kids and let them be those content creators as much as possible and I say that yet my kids really aren't there yet and they need me to be that that sage uh, you know I, I, I toggled on day and night the other day and I, I was treated like a, a minor god because I could do that with the kids and they were, were just in shock that I had that much power and I looking around and I, I don't want that much power I want you guys to be the creators and um, as a as a history teacher I, I'm trying to teach the kids to you you need to be storytellers that's what historians are and I think that is absolutely critical that we get these guys in there and let them immerse in this world uh, and let that creativity come out because you know frankly many of us and myself included and in, in schools all over the the country and the world we've kind of tested that that creativity out of kids and uh, I see it as my job to <laughs> get it back and uh, I, I think Minecraft is uh, is way ahead of many other ways to do that. I, I might jump in if I can. Um, I've, I, I mean I put that question forward to the group anyway and I, I feel quite strongly about this because over the last two years I have been told by people who are advocates of game-based learning that the only way to do it and the best way to do it is to is to just let the kids play and they will learn. Um, I completely agree with Joel's comment earlier that that it is about comfort level, it is about the teacher and and trusting them to know their students, their skill level and, and trusting them to do what is right for their excuse me, for them and their students. So I think there is room for both. I think there is room for open-ended student collaboration and I also think there's room for um, specific lessons that are teacher-directed and, and have specific learning goals. I don't think there's a right or a wrong here. I think there's just a, a, a exploration of a tool here and, and tools can be used in various ways. They don't have to be set in the one way to be used. I'm going on wavering between two questions. I wanted to follow up a little bit on the uh, question about the cultures at school. And um, I think because you've all been able to experiment um, with Minecraft and you've been successful with Minecraft, um, you might assume that you come from a very supportive environment where people said, yes, we're behind you, go for it, it's all good, we trust you. Um, but we've all heard from other teachers who have had Face some resistance, um, 
I think there's some skepticism still um, in the educational community. Um, I've encountered, other people have encountered. Where, where do you think Minecraft is going to be in, say, five to ten years, and maybe not just Minecraft, but video games also? Are we seeing, is, this, is Minecraft a, a, a once-in-a-generation tool that we can use in learning environments, or are we at the point where video games are evolving to the point where, A, teachers are literate and fluent enough in games themselves to turn them into something you can use in the classroom, and are the tools themselves flexible enough to build the kind of environments you need for effective education? All right, that let's, was let's a, um, that up. <laughs> that was a, a huge question. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, it's very I was very wavering hard. between two and I asked both, I think, so <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's, it's um, very hard to sit here and, and say, um, that that what we're doing is right and what we're doing is is and I, I do believe that what we're doing is cutting edge and I do believe that you know we're pioneer pioneering something here and, and we're lucky to be teachers at this time I really do I think this is is definitely it's revolutionized my teaching um, and revolutionized those students I've worked with it with I believe it's revolutionized revolutionized their learning but where this is going, I've got no idea, and and, and how, how do we now provide the data that this is actually indeed helping our um, our teaching learning and how it's helping our students and, and stuff like that. So I, I'm not sure I actually answered your question at all. Joel, you wanted to say something. I'm going to hand back to you. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm going to probably be, you know, equally... Uh, <laughs> evasive in my answer as well. Um, you know, I, I do think that, I do happen to think that Minecraft is, is as you called it, uh, Rick, a once-in-a-generation game. Um, but I don't think, you know, one in, once-in-a-generation game in terms of what it allows you to do and what it um, brings to the classroom, but I, I don't think that means it's it's the only game that's that's going to be this useful in the classroom. I mean, I think um, I, I think Minecraft is really opening up eyes to the way children interface with get video games and what it allows them to go on to do. I, you know, uh, let, let's forget about schools for a minute. I talk to parents all the time, just just my neighbors, you know, the or the the parents of of my my kids' friends, and you know, they all recognize that there's something different going on when their kid plays Minecraft as opposed to other video games. Uh, there's this, uh, you know, there's this, there's this thought process that goes on of, of solving problems and, and being self-reliant and, and figuring out new skills in order to, uh, to do more in the game. And, and those skills are not limited to the, the game itself. Those skills are about learning how to make videos or learning how to program. Um, so, I mean, I, th my hope, my sincere hope, and my belief is that Minecraft is raising the awareness of of educators, of parents, of administrators, uh, as to what games are able to do in the classroom. You know, I don't think there's another game right around the corner that's going to offer us the breadth of, of of experiences that Minecraft lets you have, but. You know, I do think that because, you know, if, if a school has had success with Minecraft, then, you know, if something like, you know, they may be open to something like SimCity EDU, which is a more sort of uh, uh, contained, focused experience, um, you know, my hope is that Minecraft allows other games and other types of, of learning content to, to get into the classroom easy, more easily. If I may jump in. Um, great comments, Joel and Alfie, both of you. Um, one of the things Alfie and and I have talked about recently, as uh, and I believe he even might have put it in his blog. I'm not sure, but was basically quotes that we've heard from a lot of people. Um, basically, Minecraft being a blank piece of paper. You know, Minecraft being the tool that it should be. Um, so when you ask about shelf life and things like that, and people's readiness to accept it, um, I think that it's right now. It's, it's still wide open. There's still so much to do. Uh, when you talk about how are teachers ready to uh, accept this thing as a tool in the general classroom, I think you're always going to have, and probably everybody on this panel and everybody in the live stream is 
either the person at the school or one of the first people at the school to have used it, to have integrated it. And because of that, it's kind of up to us to say, we could just say, you know what? You have to learn it to use it. Or we could take another perspective and say, you know what? I know how to use it. Let me help you with something you're thinking of, show you what can be done with it, and maybe that will encourage those teachers to then step up and say, you know what, let's start baby lessons and show me how to create a world. Show me how to do this. Show me how to do this. And I'd be completely willing to do that with my staff at, at the school if they were willing to be, if they were that interested. And I think that's really how the community is going to grow, is that we are going to be those so-called experts for now. And as Joel said, it could be from Minecraft, but it opens up the doors for other things like, you know, some other project Joel's working on that I'm pretty excited about. So <laughs> the, the Kerbal stuff. I mean, it's it's coming too, you know, and it's going to be there as well. Um, but it does open up that door, and, and, and I'm okay with being that expert, that, that point man at the school. Um, the, the goal now is then to now make this thing readily available to multiple teachers. So, for instance, me putting up maps, Elfie puts up maps, things like that. It's okay if a teacher wants to just download a map and try it out because that's what's going to get them involved, right? You know, you, you see that graphic all the time of how... Um, the graphic is a picture and someone asking, I don't know what's so special about this game, but I can't stop playing it, right? <laughs> We've all seen that graphic. So once you get them in there, I think that a lot of the teachers will dive right in, you know, and we want to be those people there to support them. When um, we talk about, you know, Joel's maybe once in a generation, um, Minecraft being a, you know, a game that's unlike other games and in a lot of ways a response to the limitations of the guy. I know Joel's been playing games for decades and I've been playing you know, probably longer. Um, but um, Minecraft gave us the ability to affect the world around us in ways we've never been able to do before. There are always these artificial walls and artificial limits and you could only interact with what the developer allowed you to interact with and wrote routines to interact with. Uh, Minecraft is so wide open and on top of just uh, so wide open, it's modeled by other people. Uh, the fact that anybody in the world can say, hey, I've got, I've got an idea and I know a little bit about programming and I'm going to learn how to make something and then move on from there to make some pretty incredible mods. Um, obviously, that's extending the shelf life further, but are there mods that you use in your teaching that um, are valuable, mods that make your job easier? Are there mods you'd like people to write? And I especially want to think about that when El what Elfie was talking about with data. We don't have enough hard data about what students are doing in game. We don't have the ability to say um, they built this much, they placed this many blocks, they dug this many blocks up, they walked this far. They we don't have those hooks are in the game, but we don't have the data coming out that's going to support um, research on learning. I don't think yet. Um, I know that's something our researchers at Temple have been looking for and asking for. Um, Obviously, the mod community is not there yet. They're, that's not what they're focusing on, but we are seeing projects like um, computer craft and custom NPCs um, and miscraft being used. But um, what mods do you are valuable to you, and, and what would you like to see? If, if you had a mod you could imagine in your head, is there something you'd like to see uh, created and uh, you could use in your classroom? I know I've been hogging, so I'm just going to start real quick, Joel, and then I'll, I'll pass it over to you. I actually, it's not a mod, but I, I kind of just mentioned it there in the chat that Alfie and I have really worked a lot on using the vanilla in-game scoreboard system. Now, initially, a lot of people, I say that, and they go, oh, what mod is that? What mod is that? It's not. It actually comes with the game. It's just nobody has taken the time to really investigate what this can do. So, I mean, we've created... An answer, answer, multiple choice answer system within it. With 1.7 coming out, there's going to be amazing amounts of data that we can collect. How many times they've picked up grass? How many t blocks they've walked? I mean, you can use this data to as evidence for that hard evidence and such like that. So um, that was my non-mod comment. So we'll go ahead and see the mods everyone else has. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've I've just heard so many stories of, of people using mods. You know, you mentioned computer craft, which is a lot mod that lets you program, use a real programming language called Lua inside the world of Minecraft. So using that uh, to teach introductory programming. I've heard of uh, 
teachers using the Mo Creatures mod, which adds a large number of extra creatures into the different biomes in Minecraft and had their students go on uh, ecological surveys. Um, you know, Eric, uh, Eric's World of Humanities map, which is the, sort of this epic historical world, uh, is, is populated by literally thousands of characters, uh, and many of them are famous people from history that you can walk up to and uh, interact with, and they'll, they'll send you on missions. So, you know, I, I think it just, it, you know, it's just a natural extension. Once, once you become comfortable with using Minecraft as a teaching tool, there's so these many different ways to, to push it forward. And, you know, I... I you know, I'll throw in my own my own plug that uh, you know sometimes you get the opportunity to make your own mod that uh, to teach specific content. I, I recently had a, had a chance to work with uh, some folks at, at Caltech and um, and Google and Eline Media, as well as uh, Daniel Ratcliffe, who's the creator of Computercraft, to create a mod called uh, QCraft, uh, which and and our high our high level purpose was to create a Minecraft mod that introduces students to the concepts of quantum physics and quantum computing. So we, we brainstorm all these ways that we can make Minecraft blocks mirror what happens at the, the subatomic scale uh, to make these uh, sort of bizarre uh, but yet totally real uh, physics uh, tangible to today's kids, to Minecraft players. Um, you know, so that's, I think, a perfect... The, the reason I bring it up is I think it's a perfect example of you know, if there's specific content you want to teach and it's not out there, all you got to do is find some like-minded people and you can probably make it happen. Um, and so, you know, right now we're, we're kind of dotting, you know, crossing our T's and dotting our I's to actually put together the, the lesson plans and curriculum um, so that teachers can download this and, and use it in their, in their, uh, in their own classrooms. Um, and so I, I think, I'm hoping that a lot of people look at this partnership sort of as a model example of what's possible when you get a lot of uh, stakeholders um, together with a with sort of a singular mission uh, to uh, specifically with Minecraft to teach a specific set of content because it's it's absolutely uh, uh, replicable. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I'm and also looking forward to. Uh, uh, these mods that everybody keeps talking about, and if they're going to be out, they're going to be out, they're going to be out, and I, I cannot wait to dive in myself, but uh, right now my, my favorite one I can't live without is uh, custom NPCs, and from, uh, again, that history teacher perspective, being able to uh, have my kids immersed into a world where they're interacting with other kids. I, my, my kids are pretty isolated. It's a, it's a fairly rural community, and so to, to get them to speak with other uh, uh, characters in the world is fabulous. Uh, we're moving into uh, Japan after this, and I've already got plans for uh, you know, high, the kids having to hire samurai to follow them around from village to village. And that writing component, that is a big part of it. I, I think the, the interacting with the NPCs really will will breed a lot of excellent writing from these kids, that first-person perspective that I'm, I'm always looking for. So I couldn't live without that. Um, I'll weigh in. I use Miscraft a lot for uh, allowing students to have a base world to work from and, like Shane does, go to other worlds to do um, uh, sort of specific learning tasks and things like that. Um, I definitely use in-game NBT edit a lot, which is sort of allows me to tweak and modify things. That's sort of a go-to mod for me now as well. It allows me to to change the the um, uh, hidden data on things and and use them for specific purposes in that way. So they're probably my two two go-to mods. We've got, uh, I think. I'm trying to think what everybody teaches here. I know we've got history teachers, math teachers. Um, Alfie, you've done science. Um, I've done projects with people doing English, uh, English projects about uh, characterization and plot and uh, writing scripts and acting them out and recording them. Um, is Minecraft best 
suited to, obviously it's not only suited to one or two types of, uh, of disciplines. And we always, STEM is a huge buzzword, but um, what is it about Minecraft that you can use it in so many different ways? From particle physics to ancient history to you know, modeling a cell. Um, is it easier to use Minecraft for certain subjects? Is, is it better suited for certain subjects or is it really up to the teacher's imagination? I think it really is up to the teacher's imagination. I mean it, the whole uh, there was a comment last week, and I cannot remember who said it. But when I watched the the recording of last week, someone said Minecraft is like a piece of blank paper, or it might have been a comment in the live stream chat. But it's it's a it's a blank piece of paper, and that's exactly right. It it's it it's equally usable anywhere, depending on the imagination of the teacher using it. In my opinion, I mean, I, yeah, I have used it for science, and it was a great way to to do experiments and get students interacting in, in a way I can't do in the classroom. So, you know, th there's benefit there, but it's, it is just a blank piece of paper. Like uh, the cell tour I could do um, on the board talking about the cell and stuff like that, it's no different to what I've done in, you know, the last eight years of my teaching, only this time it's a three-dimensional space that students can explore. So, yeah, I think it really does depend on the, on the teacher using it. And the hunger craft we had here with Joel, with our, our T4 T kids and the global kids, what we taught our kids is about social inequality and reference to how the people in the districts had no means to food or survival, and the capital had all the lush and the buildings made up iron and better living arrangements. And what we taught the kids is about the idea of working together and the different ideas working as a social group to be able to make both sides of the the map survive. Um, the great thing about that is that most te teens have c competition between them. The idea that like, we're going to defeat you, you're going to defeat me, but at the end of the day learning from the map and learning from the map that Joel created, they learned that they have to work together. Uh, just like the novel, just like the novel of uh, The Hunger Games, they had to do a hunger craft where they learned that without different the district working without the capital, it just wouldn't function. And a lot of the teens learned that. Some even came up with ideas about trying to go outside the map, trying to find other means for food and survival. But they learned that ultimately, at the end, they had to work together. They had to barter a system where both systems have to work together. And to teach a 14 to 18 years old about something like that and getting them engaged and working together is very interesting to me because most teens, when they come together and they have different age groups, they sometimes don't always work well together. So. Um, that whole game and the whole Hungercraft idea about them exploration and storyline and designing everything else made them work really well together, especially teens from two separate groups and two separate organizations. So that was really great because towards the end, asking them questions and collecting data, what they learned about the game, they also learn how to bond together and come together as groups and tell each other what are the pitfalls and the different mistakes they learned in the beginning about being enemies versus in the end becoming friends and working as two communities that need to survive together. Thanks to no I mean Joel, Joel shut down the whole oh, please stop, them. stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um well but no, I mean, you know, I, I can't think of other than taking these kids, putting them on a bus, going out in the woods and then role playing a game like this, I don't know how else we would have given them this experience. I mean the fact that we were able to get them together in in downtown Brooklyn uh, you know, in front of computer screens and have these, you know, really meaningful uh, experiences. And, you know, uh, to, to answer the original question is, is I, I don't think Minecraft is best at teaching one subject or another, but I, I think an interesting way to look at it is, you know, there... You know, there are some subjects that traditionally have been shown, you know, you can teach well in, um, with a computer game, right? Like, you can, you can drill math questions with a computer game with, with a lot of efficiency. You can track progress. You can assess. You can vary the skill level based on student responses, you know. So math is, quote, unquote, easy to teach with a computer game. But, you know, take, some, take something from the social studies 
feel. Take something like we're talking about uh, with, the, with the Hungercraft experience. Um, you know, I can't think of another game that's going to allow students to, to live in communities and, and form governments and trade and, and barter and, you know, do all this stuff that's the bread and butter of a, of a, of a history or a government classroom. Um, and, and as a sort of tangible, experiential um, learning experience. And that's a good segue to something else I was thinking about. Um, there was a program that I, I heard about a while back, and I haven't heard any more about it. Uh, Mo Yang was talking about block by block, um, where you would uh, take satellite photos of a village and um, then recreate it in Minecraft. You can import that, that, that map data into Minecraft and then lay out a village. And then they would have uh, the, the kids who live in the village uh, Get on Minecraft and then recreate, build the village in their own, in their own, um, in their own eye. And I thought that'd be a fantastic thing for Philadelphia um, because there's so many different places that um, could be rebuilt, could be better, could be different. Um, I worked with a couple of teachers from the Minecraft uh, Teachers Google Group. Uh, one in Detroit and one in Los Angeles, and they did an urban planning project where they were talking about how you can reimagine re your city. Um, and Jackson, when you're talking about the social equity, um, I think you have moments for teaching that aren't traditional classroom moments. Uh, you're teaching about something bigger, something broader, something more community focused. Um, what is it about Minecraft that gives you the ability to collaborate on on larger projects? Is it just is it that social interaction? Is it the collaboration, the participation? Um, so much of being online together in that same space is, um, I think, is really new to not just kids, not just students, but to all of us. It's you know 20 years, I guess, that we've we've been able to do it, and this is maybe the most, the easiest to get into. The most visual in Minecraft has a lot of strengths that other it's improved upon a lot of the earlier virtual environments. Um, but what else can we do with Minecraft outside of the classroom to facilitate these sort of um, community projects, social projects? Um, Joel, um, Joel and uh, Jackson, have you thought about other things um, to do with the library beyond Hungercraft? I'll jump in, Joel. I think it would be really great. Uh, one of the good things about that is Brooklyn is very big, and uh, most of the library that we usually work out of is the central one, which I'm at right now. But it would really be great if we have the opportunity to travel to other locations, one out of the 60 branches of Brooklyn Public Library. And just looking at the history when the libraries were first built, and create a game, uh, maybe a map on the history behind behind that. One of the great projects I just worked on right now was uh, having a group of kids, Mighty Force, design a video game about finding pages around the Central Library, learning about the history in that area. So maybe integrating something, some of that into the hunger, I mean, to Minecraft, that would work out really great. Some kind of history and building and everything else. That they would definitely get a lot out of that and. The library has so much resources in the history of Brooklyn, so it works out really well together. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I actually remember, you know, myself growing up in New York City, I, I believe it was a third grade project. We studied some of the history of Manhattan and Brooklyn and, and the rest of the city, and we, we studied uh, the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. And, uh, you know, it culminated with a field trip walking across the bridge. and. You know, I, I can just easily see building the Brooklyn Bridge sort of as, you know, yet another, you, you know, feature of, of, that, of that lesson. Um, you know, I, I just think there's so many things you can do with this game. Um, you, you, be, and especially because it's so popular right now. I mean, when was the last time that teachers were getting excited about a teaching tool like a smart board and you could walk into, like, any park, any playground, any birthday party, and you can say, hey, what do you kids think about smart boards? And, you know, what do you think the reaction would be? But you can do that now. You can walk into a birthday party and say, hey, kids, what do you think about Minecraft? I, I had three Minecraft characters come to my door on Halloween a couple weeks ago, right? Um, you know, so just using that energy and that excitement, I, I just think, you know, we're, we're just scratching the surface here. Even, even with the, the broad range of projects we're talking about now, 
Um, I, I'd love to hear what kids think uh, we should be doing with Minecraft, even not in a school setting. I think Block by Block is a great example. Uh, I actually had uh, the opportunity to talk to the folks um, from uh, UN Habitat that, that are administering that, that program recently. And, you know, they've had some success in a few cities, and their goal is to bring this, you know, very large. I think within the next five years, something like that, they want to uh, use Minecraft to reimagine public spaces in something like 300 cities, and, and they're trying to figure out how the heck they're going to get funding to do that. Um, but, you know, I think the, the fact that they're so excited that they're committed to go out and try to make this happen just shows... Uh, you know, how powerful Minecraft is and, uh, you know, that, that the potential is, is really there. I think um, we're coming to the top of the hour and I think I was going to ask for final thoughts and I think, Joel, that was, I think that was a good, would you be content with that serving as your final thoughts? I think that was a good launching off point right on. Um, Jackson, I know you need to get going. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share? No, and referenced and reference to Minecraft and libraries, I definitely see Minecraft being something libraries will engage more in the next few years, for sure. Um, my experience, were, like, I can only dream the same for any of our 60 branches, uh, to have kids from the community to be part of that. And I'm going to push for that. I'm going to push to have more librarians realize the importance of Minecraft and a library setting, an after-school library setting, and just engaging the teens that usually visit the library, or even school-age students. And for that, I'm, I hope the next five years we're able to do that. With the technology, we, libraries are moving forward to every day. I know sure, for sure Brooklyn Public Library is moving in that, that direction. So that's what I'm hoping and crossing my fingers. Great. Thank you very much. John, any last thoughts? Sure. Uh, my thoughts are uh, the world would be a better place if we just all played more. And uh, I really want to be able to get my kids to think that too and to join in and think how great it would be if uh, I got all the teachers at, at my school and, and we were able to do that with our kids, feel comfortable enough to you know, roll up the sleeves and, and dive into something like this or uh, any other game. Uh, it's it's so important. Great, thanks. Shane? Final thoughts for me. Um, I mean, it's been great listening to all of you guys. Um, I, we, we were just actually talking about in the live stream, I think that one of the things that's important for all those teachers out there is, you know, just get it, get, get it going. Try it and get something started. Um, somebody just mentioned you're going to miss every shot you don't take. Yeah, so... Get Minecraft in there. Get it as an after-school club. Get it at, at just something as a one-period thing, and you'll you'll eventually start seeing people come around. It's a it's definitely a different age now, and teachers are going to have to adjust and change to that digital age. Thanks, Shane. And Stephen, you're last, and Shane did not take an opportunity to say anything about you. So since he is now finished, he can respond. <laughs> he can say whatever you want to Shane. <laughs> All right. Um, no, I'll be nice. Um, look, I, I just the last thing I would like to say is that there is no harm in giving this a go. The key part here is you do it where you're comfortable, give it a go, um, reflect on what happens, and then if you decide it's a good tool, then use it. If you decide it's not for you, then put it aside for now and come back to it another time when you're more comfortable with it. I think um, I really want to stress that there's no right way to do this. Just try it and and see what happens. You might find something really surprising like the rest of us did. Great. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, thank you, everybody, for a great conversation. Um, by tomorrow, we should have a full recording of the webinar and uh, other curated content up on uh, www.connectedlearning.tv. And you can share those uh, online or social networks. Uh, that would be great. And uh, this wraps up our final webinar of this month-long series. Um, that doesn't mean the conversations have to end here. Uh, we encourage everyone to keep the energy going by using the Twitter hashtags um, Minecraft Education and Connected Learning and by getting involved in the ongoing conversations within the Minecraft Teachers Google Group and the Minecraft and Education Google Plus community. Um, 
Thanks again to everyone who tuned into these live events, and we hope you'll continue to share these videos and resources with your networks uh, to show them why Minecraft is a great educational tool. And um, final note, I would like to thank uh, John Barramoni. He has been invaluable in keeping us all on track the whole month, and we really appreciate everything he's done. Uh, thanks, everybody. We are offline, so we are good. Weird, I dropped out right at the end, but that was a good time. I mean, <laughs> right on. So again, thank you everyone for your time, your energy, your insights. And like Rick mentioned, we'll be doing a lot of archiving in the next, you know, 24 hours or so. And I'll send you all a thank you email with a link to where this content's going to be on the ConnectedLearning.tv website, so you can share that with your networks just in case they didn't get a chance to catch this live. Great, thank Great. you very much, John. Thanks it's for been all a your pleasure. Work. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Right. Talk hey, to everyone. you soon. Take care. Bye. Good night. Shane and Elfie, right. I cannot believe how, how you guys were able, not able to attack each other tonight. This was <laughs> you, were, you were absolutely civil. <laughs> in public, always civil yes. in public. Shane not a big good in public. Shane the one that's I'm always civil in public. <laughs> It's probably because we spend so much time together, like two brothers, yes? We love each other, but man, I'm going to strangle you sometimes. <laughs> I think it's because Matt wasn't here. I think Matt's the True. instigator. Matt's yeah. the catalyst. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. All right, guys, I'm going to get out of here. Got yeah, all right. All, all right, thanks, everybody. Thank this is great. Thank all you. Right. Thanks. Take care. Good night.